It's interesting because with the Rudy Gobert situation, I just wonder well, what's the Jazz future. Right. We're yeah, we're ground zero out here, as you know. All right, my man, we're going to start in three, two, one. Everybody, welcome to another edition of the Coach Scott Fields Show. I'm the Coach Scott Fields. We've got a special guest today. We're going to cue the music, allow some people to come on live with us, and we're going to sit here and chop it up with my man, Chris, from NBA TV. Here comes the music. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those high energy guys, man. <laughs> Here we go. Wednesday, May 6th, 2020. And again, you're on another edition of the Coach Scott Field Show. I uh, want to, you know, thank everybody who has subscribed to the YouTube channel. If you have not, subscribe for free to the Coach Scott Field Show channel. Also, follow and like the uh, Coach Scott Field Show on Facebook, where we usually bring it to you live. Last two days, had little hiccups with that. Uh, keep the reactions coming. Keep the keep the comments. Keep the questions coming because we have an outstanding time. My man, Chris Miles. Welcome to the Coach Scott Field Show, my friend. It's crazy. You say uh, May 6th, and I said, wait, is it March 6th? It could be <laughs> either at this point. I just, I, I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell. We, we should be in the playoffs right now, and then you would be so inundated with work and travel and, you know, sideline reporting. And so it is unique times that we're living in right now. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I've been involved with basketball my entire life. And I was saying in March, I'm like, hmm, late March, early April. Has there ever been a time where I wasn't watching or playing basketball? That's no. That's right. Yeah. The first time that I, when I say I can remember, ever. Period. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. It, it feels, it's unprecedented to be sitting at home, physical distancing, social distancing, you know, making decisions for the, for the greater good, for those who are less vulnerable. So uh, how are things out there where you're at right now? Are, are things doing a little bit better? Is it? Well, I'm just outside of Washington, D.C., and I feel as if, you know, I see the stories, but I'm almost detached from it because I was able to quarantine from the start. Yeah. So the only time I really notice it, other than when I watch the news, is when I go to the grocery store, yeah. and I'm like, man, this is yeah. weird because all the cleaning suppliers are gone. All of the lean meats and the beef, they're all gone. So I got to, like, time it out at 7 o'clock in the morning on Monday. That's when I realized, like, yeah. But, you know, uh, luckily I'm, I'm in a situation with my family and, and our house. So I don't notice it until that moment and also yeah. not working, obviously. That's the, yeah. that's the strange part. Right, right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, those of you who don't know, but you probably should, uh, Chris Miles is a... Um, is, is, a, is a TV legend. He's on NBA TV. He, he's cutting it up and uh, doing a lot of great things. And let me give you a little, little nugget here today, Chris. Do you know it was 18 years ago that Allen Iverson was known for his practice rant? <laughs> it's the Twitter I do. <laughs> you know, it's like Twitter does not let you skip any of those, uh, those dates, those anniversaries. Wow. Exactly. We're talking about practice. <laughs> I feel him on that, though, in the sense of what he was trying to say. It yep. just came across wrong. And as you see behind me, I know another infamous guy for his playoffs rant. So I've, I've been around <laughs> a guy that knows a thing or two about uh, getting some slack for that. There you go. There you go. Well, listen, uh, you've been on NBA TV since, what, 2017. Mm -hmm. And uh, to talk to us a little bit about your journey. I mean, who, who was your mentor? Who was your role model? And who did you want to be like, or who did you want to learn from getting into the industry, my friend? Well, that's a great question in this sense. I wanted to uh, intern at a World Trade Center, then I interned at ESPN, and I interned at the NBA's offices um, because I wanted to be involved in the business side of sports. And while doing that, I kind of realized that you're never around the games. When it's that corporate, you're dealing with Sprite, 
in the marketing partnership or Nike, and you're not actually watching the action. So while at ESPN in, in their uh, corporate office, I actually met Stan Verrett, who's been mm. a longtime sports center anchor. Now, when I met him, it was his first year, second year at ESPN. And uh, a friend of mine, my boss said, hey, you know, will you talk to him? And he gave me a few minutes of his time. He said, look, if you're interested in trying to be on air, I think you can since you have good presentation skills. I was like, I never thought that was a real opportunity. So I pursued it from there and changed my work study at school at Fairfield University. Okay. At a TV station and started hosting basketball shows. And I've been hosting shows in some form or fashion since. So that was 2002. Nice, nice. So you've you've uh, you've definitely uh, chopped wood and carried water and uh, climbed the ranks, and you do a great job. I'm a fan. I think I think your uh, chemistry with those you work with, their personality, uh, you're definitely a great fit, and it's great for the game. Thanks. I I love it. So hopefully it comes across in that way. Oh, it does. It it definitely does. So let's do this. What's the day in the life of Chris Miles like? Uh, of course, I know right now with COVID nineteen, it's probably you know, adapted a little bit, but typically what's the day in the life for you to get up, get preparations, get the creative juices flowing, uh, contact NBA TV, uh, put, put together a show idea to where you're, you know, you've got, you know, players on with you or whatnot, kind of take us through that process. Well, so I live in Washington, DC, and as you know, the studio is in Atlanta. So typically what happens, let's say I'm working Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the week. Um, I make sure I DVR games almost every night. Yep. And so like when I wake up as I'm getting breakfast, I'm watching the previous night's games uh, that maybe I missed and I'm fast forwarding through the commercial. So typically I can watch three to four games in a two to three hour span. And I think that's very important um, in this day and age in the sense that I get the sense that a lot of people don't watch games. Mm -hmm. They read the box scores. They look at the stats because when they say things, I get the impression that they're not paying attention. So I find that to be the number one key. See, so actually watch the games and make sure I catch every team as often as possible mm -hmm. to, to have the information that I need as opposed to just seeing the box scores. And then, uh, for instance, on a travel day, if I'm on a plane, I typically have the notes from, you know, the most important games and following the storylines and just going over them, trying to commit some yeah. of the memory. For instance, if it's uh, Zion Williamson in the lineup for the Pelicans, well, then I know that he's had 10 straight games at 20 or more points or that he's the only teenager to score 25 or more twice against the Lakers. I try to commit some of that to memory. Yes. On, the, on a flight. So when I land and it's time to have the meeting for the show and whatever we're pre prepare, preparing for, if a player or a coach thinks something else is more important than something I, I want to go with, I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that too. There you so go. It's, it, I think the key to that is to always be prepared for the changes mm -hmm. because you think you're going a certain way and then something happens and it's not yeah. that. Um, when Blake Griffin got traded uh, to the Pistons, we had our whole show together. Throw out the rundown. Get it together. <laughs> you know, Come out with another to... one page. Uh, when David Stern passed, unfortunately, throw yeah. out the rundown. We're just going out and going. And it's just from years of paying attention to David Stern, interning at the NBA, that sort of thing, I felt very prepared for it. I didn't yeah. feel as if, oh, what do I do now? Yeah. So – I you're like me, you love the game, you're passionate about it. You've got a lot of friends in the industry. So it's easy for you to pick up, gather information, do your research. It's, it's, you love it. So since you love it, it's not really a job. Yeah. I mean, even now it's, I find it uh, more difficult to find things to watch now. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> Normally I'm watching games and I, I think the appreciation from it comes uh, for the fact that I played, but I was, I knew I wasn't good enough to make it to the NBA. Okay. So the, anyone who's in the league, um, and I would say the same for the NFL, I would say the same for major league baseball, but anyone who's at a professional level, there's a different level of appreciation that I have. Yeah. So for a guy like, I don't know, say Fred Van Fleet, you know, when I see his story and what he's doing, I'm excited for him because I'm like, yeah. man, he's a yeah. small, a smaller guard. It couldn't have, it, there could have been a situation where it didn't work out for him. And to right. see what he's doing, I think I, I bring that exuberance and that enthusiasm to the situation because I really feel it for them. 
Great, great example. Great example. Talking about basketball, talking about Zion. I mean, uh, too bad we don't have more of a body of work to draw from. Of course, I'm a professional coach. I'm, o- I'm always around the game. I'm always, you know, I'm with my son and I'm teaching him life lessons through the game. But who, who do you feel at this point, Chris, would be your rookie of the year if you were to vote today? Oh, it's John Morant, hands down. Um, I just think I remember this debate and being frustrated that the biggest part of the conversation was that there was no way that Zion Williamson could reach the minimum criteria for the amount of games to play to be rookie of the year. Patrick Ewing has the least amount of games to be named rookie of the year. I believe that number is at 55. So if Zion Williamson had a full season, yeah, then maybe I think we could have an open discussion of, oh, one or the other. But I think for, for John Morant and the Grizzlies to be in contention eighth out West and to be That's a right. team that looked destined for the postseason. I think sometimes, again, what we were talking about earlier about looking at the box scores, I watched Mm -hmm. Ja play 15 times, maybe 20 times this year, and I thought, man, one thing he does is he sacrifices his stats for the flow of the game. Yes, yes. To make sure that, okay, I can run this play right now. I'm going to give it up and, and get off the ball, and maybe he finishes with 17 points, 11 assists when he could have had 25 points, but he's impacted the game and That's he right. blocked Kyrie. We remember that moment because he wanted to have an impact on the game. So for me, uh, John Morant won Zion, obviously number two. You see, and I'm with you because Zion just doesn't have the body of work throughout the season to put it into the, to the discussion or have dialogue about it. And I, I'm like you as a coach, I love a true point guard mentality, someone who's going to control pace, control space, get it going, uh, you know, get into the teeth of the defense, kick, get get the teammates involved, but yet make his teammates better. And for him to have the Grizzlies in the eighth seed in the West, I think is phenomenal. And you have to, you know, go with him because he's doing a lot of special things right now. Absolutely. And if you try to put his attributes down on a piece of paper, here's a job story for you. Um, at All-Star this year in Chicago, um, after the, I guess, the International Rookie Sophomore Challenge, whatever we're calling it these, this, these days, <laughs> um, my job was to go interview almost every player, try to get a soundbite from each. And what I found most intriguing about John ja Morant is I went to talk to him about the, the Miles Bridges takeover in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. And he goes, oh, the game was great until then, but then, I mean, the fourth quarter became a dunk contest. And he looked so disappointed Mm. so angry at the fact that an all-star exhibition game turned into an all-star exhibition game that it wasn't competitive to the final buzzer and i i've watched him play a lot i've heard him but to see the real frustration there Mm. i'm like oh the league has a problem yeah, that, that resonates. That's a great story because, again, it's going to tell you his competitive nature and how he loves the purity of the game, and he just wants to play the game the right way. Yeah, I always look at it when I, when I think of a current player and how much they're paid now. I think, okay, would this guy in the 1960s when you had to work a second job mm. still try to play in the league? John ja Morant, yes. Zion Williamson, yes. Luka Doncic, yes. And I think the league is in great hands because of that. I mean, it's just wonderful and refreshing to see these guys. See, I I agree. I agree with you 100%. I think they're going to pass the torch on. And, uh, you know, the the youth in the game right now, even though some will argue that it's saturated with talent that's not quite ready for the league uh, physically, but yet I think there's great, great potential with what's going on. and, And the brand is going to be solid. What's interesting that you say that, I saw Dwayne Wade talk about this the other day, and it's as if the 22 and under crowd leapfrogged the 23 to like 28 year old crowd. Mm. When you look at Luca, when you look at Ja, when you look at Zion, they said, oh, we're not waiting our turn. We're going to take it. And and to to name some names, I mean, I would think Bradley Beal. I mean, even if you go to the 22 and under and put Tatum in there, it just seems like that group said, oh, no, we're not waiting for 25 and over. We want to win now, and we're going to compete now. And I think, you know, having this stoppage in play is so frustrating because I'm like, I would love to see these guys in the postseason. Yeah, I wanted to see what Tatum was going to do in in the playoffs, and I hope we do get back to it. 
That's right. That's right. See, and I'm with you because I think these young guys, they, they play with they play with a lot of passion and, and I love to see them compete and play with that passion as fans. You can connect with that and you can identify with that, especially being in a Boston, you know, a, that kind of mentality is throughout the culture there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and then, okay. How about let's go coach of the year. I, I, I love talking about coach of the year. I, and again, there, there's a lot of great coaches who have done a great job up to this point before we had the work stoppage. And of course here in Salt Lake city, we're ground zero for it because of Rudy Gobert coming out, you know, with the COVID and then boom, everything stops. We're in mid March. We're like, Oh my gosh. And everything, everybody took a deep breath. Like what is going on? But who do you like for coach of the year? So I have a list of five. Okay, so I probably list, have the same list. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go coming in at five for me, Brad Stevens. I just think when you look at how the players are developing and their chemistry, um, even when you look at a guy like Daniel Tice, okay, now he's a fortified starting center on a small ball team at 6'8". They made that work. Jason Tatum taking that leap again. Kimball Walker, an all-star starter fitting in. I just think all the pieces, whatever injuries they have, whatever – turmoil they may have behind closed doors we don't see it and they're third in the east and I think they were team poised with players that could take possessions in final minutes of games oh they got two guys you know you trust maybe three or four uh, if you count Marcus Smart as a role player that could you know hit some bucks so anyway I look at Brad Stevens in the conversation but third in the east not so much uh, Frank Vogel for the Lakers but we know the history of the award they're not going to give it to a guy with two MVP candidates in Anthony Davis and LeBron James. So I put him got more to work with. Yeah. Mike Malone in Denver. Uh, if it wasn't for the other two candidates, I would say Mike Malone, just looking at uh, Nikola Jokic and what he's done throughout the mm. season and how he's progressed in the right. It just seems like the team started here this year and progressed in this way. Uh, so number two, you're reigning uh, coach of the year, Mike Budenholzer but we don't really see back-to-back -back coaches of the year. It's not something that we see uh, historically in the NBA. So I went with Nick Nurse. Um, I think he was, he was in the conversation last year. I, I did the Raptors uh, preseason show. And the question I was asking to these guys, like, look, if we get to the deadline, are they going to be moving some of these contracts on the final year, trying to figure out how to be competitive again? Instead, they're second in the East. Pascal Siakam took that leap that we wondered if he could take as an all-star starter. Uh, I mean, yeah. all these Kyle Lowry still playing at a high level. I got to give credit where it's due. So uh, Nick Nurse was my guy for the 46 wins. Also, I mean, the criteria is 50 wins. There's only been two coaches who haven't reached that. And it's like the Raptors were going to get there. Yeah, uh, so yep. I went Nick Nurse, man. And I, and I love Coach Nurse. I think he does a great job of of teaching them up. Uh, he makes adjustments. And when you see Pascal Siakam being the most improved player and then could be most improved player again, like you said, took that leap uh, to doing amazing things, I, I definitely – say you've got to go that direction but I also think coach Spo has done a great job with that young heat team and and you know kind of navigated their way through that eastern conference and surprised a lot of people because yeah you've got Jimmy Butler but when you look at the young talent that he's developing and the culture that they have there I think I think he deserves to be in the conversation a little bit but I do like your list a lot here's the thing about coach Spo that's so interesting when he had too much talent, we left him on the phone <laughs> because of Wade and LeBron and Bosch, the Heatles is what they were calling them, right? And now it's like, oh, they're good, but not good enough to be in consideration. But so, right. he, yeah, he's a guy that I guess that's why awards, uh, you know, it's good to have them, but yeah. go win the championships. That's the ultimate one. And he's got some of those. See, and, and and when, when we think of questions like that, and of course me being a professional coach, I see it through that lens and I see the special situations. I see the sideline out of balance plays. I like the nuances and the little adjustments that are made during games and the game management. And uh, of course out here, you know, we had Jerry Sloan who did a great job for years and never got coach of the year. And it's like, gosh, he did it so consistently at a high level for so long that it was almost just taken for granted, you know? Yeah, I think it's the uh, I think coach of the year is interesting in a sense of if you're very, very good for an extended period of time, 
they don't want to give it to you. It's almost as you have to do something so beyond expectations. Yeah. Uh, and that's what Nick Nurse has this year. I, I believe agree. the narrative is with him. I see. And, and, and I agree. I, I, I like that pick. Uh, and of course, and again, you always hear, you know, most time coach of the year is going to go to who is coaching the MVP. Who's your MVP for this year? Cause that, it's a two man race, really. I mean, what do you think? So interesting enough, <laughs> you're right. Because that happened last year. Um, like, <laughs> right. And he, I, yep. I think, I don't know if I said that, but he was second on my list his best record in the league, but Again, we don't see back-to-back coach. Yep. I don't know why, yep. you know, yep. what happens with that. But uh, Giannis is my MVP. Now, something you need to know about me. I was working in uh, New Orleans uh, when Anthony Davis got drafted, as you see the Anthony Davis jersey there. Yeah. And yep. the general manager at the time, Del Dims, who's no longer there, so I feel comfortable telling the story. We played a, in a men's league together. <laughs> And he, nice. oh, he told me about Giannis four <laughs> months before. I mean, he was salivating over the guy, and then they didn't draft him. So yeah. when I say I was like the first guy on Team Giannis, president of the fan club, I've been waiting for him to blossom. Okay, so there's that. So to give you my legitimacy to this argument of back-to-back MVPs, <laughs> um, he's playing less minutes, I think about two less minutes this season than he did last year, scoring more points, grabbing more rebounds, Averaging the same assist, his three point percentage is up from 25 to 30. And oh, yeah, the Bucs have the best defensive rating in the league. And he's the one leading that charge, still averaging a block and a steal per game. He's the guy. See, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I've, uh, as, as I'm hearing your analysis, I'm going over in my head. I'm like, yes, he's added more weapons and more versatility to his game because that mid range is more consistent. He's added to the three and he's more comfortable taking that three, but I love it when just like you're watching the last dance right now for the younger generation who didn't know who Michael Jordan was when you can control the game at both ends of the floor. I see him doing that and he's doing it consistently. And like you said, they've got the best record in the league. And there's a lot of people saying, well, LeBron's sacrificing so much of his game to give for Anthony Davis, but yet Giannis is, is just what he is. He is the freak. And right now that young man, if he continues with that precision and work ethic that he has, it's that it, that's his that's his trophy and what's interesting is of course Giannis had the knee issue right before yeah. the stoppage of play so there yep. was a conversation because LeBron was ascending here's the other part of that the Lakers have the fourth best defensive rating in the league but Anthony Davis is the anchor to that Anthony yep. Davis clearly holds LeBron Brand protector and rebound yep. well and LeBron had not played defense at this level for the last five years and it's Anthony um, that's the excellent post defender that's grabbing the rebounds. So when I factor that into the equation, we're talking about the best of the best and the most valuable player in the NBA. I'm going with Giannis. Yeah. See, and, and I'm with you. And I, and I love having that conversation. You get it. You, you're around it. Your finger is on the pulse. And so to hear you kind of reiterate what my thoughts are from a distance it's, it's refreshing. So I, Hey, you're, you're right on it. What surprises have you seen in the league this year where there's somebody that just was like, Oh, well, I wasn't expecting that from him or what team has surprised you. And again, some of it, we probably skirted already, but what were some of the biggest surprises in the league that you've seen to date? I would say two surprises, the Toronto Raptors. We talked about them enough. So I'm going to move on from that. Uh, so the Memphis Grizzlies to see a team, that's like, okay, we're rebuilding. Yeah. If that's what we're doing. We have Jaron Jackson, who's a teenager. We're going to have the teenager and John Morant. So be another down year. We'll do an OKC thing and we'll get our third guy. But then they got Brandon Clark at 21 and he's top five in the league in field goal percentage and plays defense and runs to floor. So they got their athletic Abaca type of guy. Uh, yeah. And I'm yeah. like, wow. And then John Morant, his basketball IQ <sighs> is off the charts. So yes. they're competitive. So I think just to see them in the Western Conference where every team has that kind of talent where you go, okay, well, Sacramento has De'Aaron Fox and Marvin Bagley and a young team of guys, Buddy Heald. Like, they can't beat them yet. Well, they leapfrogged them. 
you know, yeah. or yep. when, you, yep. when you just look, or you see them ahead of the Blazers, right? Damian right. Lillard is TJ McConnell like a team. I know they've had a ton of injuries, but the fact that Memphis is ahead of those teams, uh, heading right. down, posters, I'm like, okay, Memphis. And then I'd have to say on the other side of that, Philadelphia 76ers. Are you kidding mm. me? You kidding me? Yeah. It's just, yeah. There, there were red flags before, but they, they, that looks like a situation where it's crazy that who do you keep? Time to destroy and rebuild it. Yeah. So through Chris Miles's lens, if you're in Elton Brand's chair, what things would you work on to get it going in the right direction? Or is that just... <laughs> I get a time machine and not give out more for the hundred million dollars. <laughs> what are you doing, my man? What's up, man? I'm like, you have Joel and B. Ben Simmons is a basically. This is what I don't get about what they did with Ben Simmons. Oh, you're a point guard. Hello, you're a point four. We we know in today's NBA, you got Draymond, you got Giannis, you you have people Lord you space. can defend. And the thing is, Ben Simmons is an excellent scorer in the post. And yep. when I say that, I'm going to name a name that it'll shock you. Like, well, they don't play the same. But to me, I'm like, like Joe Smith. Remember Joe mm. Smith? Mm. I feel as of if course. when Ben Simmons is around the basket, obviously he's a way better passer. But, man, when he catches it down low, I'm like, you know, quickly, if I'd never seen Ben Simmons playing, just saw him in the post, like he looks like Joe Smith. He yeah. finishes both hands around the basket, and they keep him away from the basket where he's not yeah. a threat, trying right. to get him to go downhill. And then your pace of play with Joel Embiid. So yeah. are you a Ferrari with Ben Simmons or are you a big truck with Joel Embiid? Great analogy. It doesn't, it doesn't work. And they both score yep. in the same area yep. around the post. Yep. So yep. if I was Elton Brand, um, I think he has to make a choice between Embiid and Simmons if we're trying to go forward. Yep. And Wow. Yeah, Just that's wow. that's tough. That, that that's a tough one. Cause see, when when I see Ben Simmons, of course he he's not comfortable, you know, shooting from distance, which I get. But when you see him handling the ball in the open floor, I think of Lamar Odom, cause he had yeah. that long long body, long frame, long arms, great passer, sees the floor, uh, you know, can play with his back to the basket. So I, I kind of see that similarity a little bit. But again, Simmons has more tools. As far as athleticism, 100%, 100%. So it, the, the Lamar Odom comparison is, is interesting to me because um, Odom was uh, in high school the same time I was. So I saw him a lot, a tremendous mm -hmm. amount. And I would say when Ben Simmons gets it in his head that he's in this attack mode, it's just this different tenacity. Yeah. That Odom never, like Odom, I always thought would be a very good point guard, but like a role player. I think if Ben Simmons, when you see when it beads out and he takes it into I'm scoring mode. Yep. You yep. Know, Odom. He stepped it up big. He didn't really do that often. Um, so it's an, it's an interesting situation where I think Elton Brand sixth in the East, you know, I think the postseason would have uh, given us a situation we see what the future would be with Brett Brown. And we just don't know now. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great talk. When, when you're sitting on the set, with the fellas, whether it's Isaiah or 3D, Dennis Scott or Steve Smith, who, who have you picked up the most insight from? And, and you'll sit there when you're interviewing them or you guys are talking and all of a sudden they drop some knowledge as you do. Who, who impresses you most when you're like, whoa, okay, that is some insight. Because they all bring something different to the table because of the positions that they play. But okay. who every once in a while just like, wow, that's I'm not being political here, and I'd say almost all of them. And and what I mean by that is, for me, loving basketball, playing basketball, I still play to this day. Yeah, it's a different level of understanding. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned player. I mean, David Griffin when he was around, I feel as if I learned. I don't know if my capacity right now is 100. Right, I think 20 percent of that came from what David Griffin would say. I felt wow. challenged. I'm like, yeah, oh, I like that. Okay. I learned an, I learned a new phrase and I learned, Oh, what is this Griff? And you know, the, the fact that he, I mean, I don't know if you're aware of this, but David Griffin knows about 13 year olds in Latvia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. He's yeah. Like I'm writing names down and I'm like, what is wrong with this guy? So that's a whole different realm, but here's yeah. the other crazy thing. And being around someone like Isaiah, you know, uh, he gets a lot of slack for, 
what happened after his playing career, this mm. and that. And, that and I'm like, those have to be outside factors because the man says things to me that I can't repeat to you. And yeah. then like, he's right a year ahead of schedule. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, I, well, I guess I could say, eh, I don't want to get in trouble. Right. But right. There, I got you. Right. There are things that he told me three years ago that came to fruition two years later. There you go. You yeah. You know. Yeah. Just to have so, that foresight. Yeah, great. And, and again, I didn't want to overstep boundaries there or put you in an uncomfortable position. I was just curious, like, you know, when you're sitting there and, and analysis is going on, I, I'm just, I'm sure that every once in a while you're probably like, whoa, that was, well, that's deep. Even at times, again, when, like when Charles Barkley is around mm -hmm. and he'll place a call and I'm sitting there right next to him and then he'll say something to me and see things that he says, he does his comedy because a lot of time he avoids the controversy by saying it in that way. Yeah, you sure. I mean? Oh, and yeah. And being around him before that moment, it's not as if he doesn't understand the situation. It's like he overstands what could happen. So then he says this thing. And I'm like, <laughs> really? But no, you know, other people don't get to see that. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, you're used to, you know, asking the questions and here I am I'm, I'm sitting here hitting you with the question so I'm, I'm sure you're like oh okay this is kind of different I kind of like this do you have any questions for me since you're you I mean this is unrehearsed unscripted but do you have any questions for me from a coach's lens or coach's perspective that I could speak on well what's interesting is I just finished watching the scheme uh on HBO and just what what's happening with college basketball mm. and the players uh, possibly getting paid for their likeness. The question for you as a coach, if you're dealing with college basketball going forward, do you think that this uh, dissension with all these guys going into the G League is something that we're going to see grow? And if the college game from a coaching perspective and recruiting perspective, I mean, the transfer portal, all of these things, do you think that college coaching will be forever changed from this two to three year period. And we're just seeing the beginning of it. Well, and, and I can speak on that because I coached at the college level for 14 years with a handful of those teams being nationally ranked and then coaching 15 years professionally. And then of course, you know, winning multiple championships in FIBA and then Keith Smart letting me work with, you know, Steph Curry when he was a rookie and then being with the Sacramento Kings and then Coach Sloan allowing me to consult with him uh, for a couple of years out here when I was between head coaching jobs in China. To me, the NCAA, Chris, is being reactionary and they're behind. Do, do I think they should have made changes years ago and had the foresight to say, you know what, we got to be ahead of the curve to keep the brand well, because right now there's, 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 it's like almost like a tenfold answer. And I don't want to be too long winded on this, but do I, do I think players should, should not be exploited 100%? Do I think they should deserve to be paid for their likenesses and autographs and things like that? 100%. Now, Jay Billis and guys uh, who are attorneys who get into the terminology and the phrasing of, of the contracts. I think there's still a lot of that, that it needs to be cleared up, but okay. You, you had young ball that played this year over in Australia and did a great job. So he bypassed because of decisions he made prior. And then you've got players right now going to the G league. That's going to surpass college because they're going to start making money for their families right away, which I get. And I think applaud the G league for having a program in place where these guys can even make that decision. Do I think there's going to be more that's going to follow suit? 100%. Now, is it better for a guy to play at a Duke or a Kentucky or a Kansas where they're, you know, they're well taken care of. And, and to me, I think that growth and development as a student athlete, at age 18, 19, and 20 is great. But with the one and done rule anyway, Coach Cal uh, at Kentucky has maximized on that well. But that's why you see the mid-major programs that play so well because they have guys with that two or three years maturity that will compete against the one and done teams because they haven't had enough time to build the chemistry. So I'm sure I'm probably answering how you thought I would answer, but I applaud the G League for what they're doing and how they're going to develop talent. And I'm glad that the... NCAA's hand has been forced to have to make decisions to make it a better environment for these young kids to come in and get a quality education and yet 
learn and develop basketball because to me basketball is hurting at the grassroots level right now because the game is overcoached and it's undertaught that's just my perspective and my lens that's a long-winded answer but that's there's so that there's so many layers to that question yeah and what's so interesting about that is i covered college basketball for i don't know eight or nine years before you know having football and um the nba is kind of my main sports but or the nfl rather and i kind of what I started to see was a frustration from coaches. Oh, it is. Who, yep. who were refused to play the game dirty. And yeah. You could see them falling behind, losing yeah. jobs. Great and point. I thought that blue chips with Nick Nolte, you know, that's that's a fictional story. But then being involved with the game, and I would see a kid that I knew, you know, with situation yep. that I'm covering him in high school. Yep. That I see him yep. not go to a school that I knew he wanted to go to. And it, just seeing all those things firsthand, I'm like, you know, it's time that it got cleaned up. You know, it is. It, it, and that's what I'm saying. I think it's long overdue, Chris, because is, is the game changing? Yes. The coaches who are going to adapt with those changes the quickest are going to be the ones who are most successful. But here's my point. And, and here I, I was coaching, but I struggle with seeing a coach who makes – multi-million dollar contracts with shoe endorsements and the player gets absolutely zero and a coach can't even take a player or a player and his family to dinner when they come in town because it's a violation now chris that's that's a problem that's an issue and you know what why can't we take better care of players as a coach who runs a program who tries to do it the right way and say you want to invite a kid over because his grandmother has just passed and yet you can't help them get home to be with a family member who is mourning or you can't invite them over to console them and, and order up a pizza and let them let everybody eat at your house big yeah. problems big problems i mean again there there's a lot of layers to that onion and i could cry cutting it right now but come on man it, 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 they got to do better they got to do better brother yeah. And if you've been involved with the sport, you know exactly what we're talking about. Exactly. Exactly. Great question, though. I love it. Let, let me ask one back to you. It's It's got to be an honor to be around such great basketball minds and basketball talent and front office executives. If you were to interview someone outside of sports and outside of basketball, or if you could have lunch with anybody, any dignitary or anybody outside of sports, who would you want to have that one hour lunch with and what kind of questions would you ask him? Oh, uh, so there's probably 20 people on that list, but judging from my reaction in the past uh, 10 years when I've almost had the opportunity or talked to someone who's had the opportunity to meet Barack Obama, uh, that he's number one on my list because he's one, a baller, man. He's a lefty. <laughs> he can play basketball, but I think uh, the fact that he's a little bit, well, I guess he's older than I am uh, by more than a decade or, and to see what he was able to accomplish, to have that yeah. vision, to have that insight, to have the discipline to accomplish that. Those are the questions I'd want to want to know um, about his biggest obstacles, about how he overcame those. Love and that. you can read about it in a book and all those things. But when you look at someone eye to eye, yes, um, sir. you know, I always, I always say to people, uh, when I was younger, uh, I'm from New York, and, and people would say, oh, well, how did you, you know, stay focused on school and books? I'm like, when I was in the seventh grade, I read the narrative in, uh, of Frederick Douglass. You're like, okay, but <laughs> I got every opportunity out there. But at no point did I think I could become president of the United States. Yeah. So for Barack Obama to be in a time period before me, and to think that and to succeed in doing it, I would love to pick his brain and ask those questions. You know what? I, I And I sit there and I think, what a great leader. And performance reflects leadership. And when he was at the helm, you know what? Things were great. And I'm not going to get political. I'm not going to get political about it. But man, I'll tell you what. You, you just got to admire a guy who, who did a great job. So the other part of that is, it's so interesting because in my, you know, 18 years now, which is crazy to say too, 17, 18 years that I've been doing this, there are people I had on that list and then I kind of thought, okay, I'll never talk to them. Um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was on that list for me and I've mm. had, you know, three opportunities to talk to him and to create the two opportunities to talk to him. And the craziest part is, you know, he's from New York, I'm from New York, but 
the guy who he said was the greatest player he played against, Earl Manigault, um, I played in Earl's tournament the summer he passed away. Wow. And so here in, you know, people use the term the goat. Here's a guy that I, you know, he's from my neighborhood and I would see him all the time. And, you know, I tell people he, he suffered from a bunch of drug use and still had, you know, ridiculous calf muscles and cut arms. <laughs> yeah. This summer he died and he'd sit there with a cigarette in his mouth, shooting from half court, this weird shot. And he's just going in with no net, <laughs> going straight yeah. in. And he's like, let me get another one back. Let me get another one back. And you're just uh, like, how was this dude great? But then now that I'm older, I think, how was that dude still built like that? You know, like, <laughs> That's awesome. You know, just to be able to talk to Kareem about yeah. what Earl was like as a young player and to see him smile and talk about it and ask Kareem about growing up in Dykeman. Um, where, you know, there's a lot of good outside basketball tournaments now. He's yeah. like, yeah, they play there. It's kind of strange. I had to travel to play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> it's just oh, great. So cool. So cool. And, and Chris, I, I look at it too like this. You, you epitomize professionalism and you do a great job. Have, have you ever had a time where within your travels or within your work where you was ever just starstruck and you were like, you'd like to go approach somebody, but you didn't? Or is that not your personality? You'll approach anybody. So here's the thing that I tell people, um, as a kid growing up in my neighborhood, all of the like famous rappers from that time period. <laughs> were there. So like I met Tupac when I was nine and he was telling us, stay in school. Don't be out here. Like, a... so the point that I make is that no matter how famous a person is, I learned from that experience. Um, like they're that. people, they no, no ser seriously, they right. want to be people. So I think, I was really nervous when I interviewed Kareem. I feel as if growing up as a Yankee fan, maybe Derek Jeter would do that for me, but it's not because he's Derek Jeter. It's because Michael Jordan tried to destroy my childhood and Derek <laughs> Jeter gave it back to me, man. So I'd be like, you know, if I saw him, it'd be cool. But like, Jeter, ah, give him a hug. You know? nice. it's I like that. that. You can understand because you talk about clutch performances it was never – Derek Jeter wasn't Alex Rodriguez, an MVP candidate. But, man, when, when you get in the postseason, you know, it's a 2-2 game in the ninth inning. This dude's getting a base knock. He's – you know, like yeah. he's, always, he's making a defensive play. He's getting the ball deep in the hole, jumping and tossing. So, I think um, Derek Jeter and, obviously, from what I said, Barack Obama, I it'll be interesting to see how I would react to those two guys. Love that. I, and, and hearing you say that, I think of – I remember taking a walk with my grandfather years ago. This is when he was still with us and we just lost him in October, but I was probably nine years old and he had his arm around me and he called me Hoss. We're walking down the railroad and he said, Hoss, he goes, I want you to remember something. He goes, treat people who are celebrities like they're not. And those who are not celebrities, treat them like they are. And he goes, and you'll do just fine young man. And I always kind of held on to that. And now that I'm, 30 years older after hearing that advice, I thought, you know what? That's, that's, that's good stuff, but just treat people like people. And you know what? We're all people. We all have our own walk of life and we can all learn and grow and evolve from each other. But I, I thought it was interesting advice for him to tell me when I was probably eight, nine, 10 years old, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes it's hard in the sense of like, I don't know, Barkley will be making jokes and I'm just looking at him. <laughs> it's because he's funny. It's yeah. not because, Charles Barkley, I'm just like, all right, I'm not that funny. So I'm going <laughs> to fall back here and it might get awkward or like, you know, Shaq's huge. So when he walks in the room, I'm like, I'm not going to say anything to upset big fella. Yeah. You know, because if he wants the to big Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he could definitely do it. And, and I bet one of these days you're probably going to get that phone call. Hey, Chris, I uh, would love you to uh, come do Shaq in a Fool with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny. That'd be funny. That'd be good times. Well, listen, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, again, I've got Chris Miles here with me. He's a, he's a, he's a host with uh, NBA TV, does an outstanding job, having a lot of fun chopping up here today. Again, I'm the coach Scott Fields with the coach Scott Fields show. This has been a fun conversation. We're having a lot of dialogue and we're able to learn and grow and evolve with Chris and he's sharing stories and he's been very selfless with this time. And I've had a lot of fun with this. Uh, what else should we chop up here in the last few minutes? Any closing words or any closing thoughts or, you know, hopefully we get back 
to some sort of normalcy and we can continue this NBA season? Because I'll tell you what, I know I'm starving for it. Yeah, I think just this time put period has put a lot of things in perspective about yeah. what's important, what's not. Um, you know, we live in a capitalistic society where we all want to achieve our dreams and our goals. But I, I still say safety first. Um, yeah, you know, got I, to. I want want to make sure that uh, people are healthy, people are happy, and we should be living that way, even not in a crisis. Make right. sure you're spending the same amount or as much time as possible with your family and make sure you're washing your hands. Why did you need this to happen to wash your hands? That's right. You're supposed to be an expert at this already. <laughs> you know what? I noticed that at the airport, that has always been a pet peeve of mine. I go use the lavatory and there's all the urinals are, you know, taken up. I go to wash my hands and I'm by myself. The math doesn't add up, people. I'm with I, I took a flight back home. <laughs> the, day that the, the day after NBA play was suspended and there's all of these uh, people in the bathroom. It was the first time I had to wait to wash my hands. Nice. Nice. Hey, if you go back to some of my other coach Scott Field shows, that's one of the first things I said. I'm like, by now you should be an expert at washing your hands, but you should have been anyway. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You want to hear the, uh, I, I do have a, I think it's PC and PG um, conversation about, washing hands so here's how it goes acc media day i think it was 20, 2011 maybe it was either 2010 or 2011 whenever Kyrie Irving was playing for duke so um you get a break when you're interviewing all of the coaches and the players you know you, you have like an eight hour day and they come in every school circles in and out and so we had a break between unc and duke um for my local station cbs in virginia so anyway i go to the bathroom and sure enough, I'm at the urinal and I kind of like, oh, I feel someone else is there. I'm like, hmm, I'm going to turn this way because this is awkward. And I turn around and I go to reach for the sink and I look up. It's Coach K. Coach <laughs> K is looking at me. My hands are going for the sink. His hands are going for the sink. And I'm like, and you, like you said, I was kind of like, oh, it's Coach K, you know, like starstruck yeah. a bit. Yeah. I was like, oh, you go, Coach. He's like, ah, you go. First of all, he's like 6'3". I never realized that to that point. I'm like, oh, okay. I wash my hands and whatever. That seems like the end of the story. But he comes in, we do the media day. And I was the only person out of 63 media members that voted for, um, I think it was, I voted for UNC to win the conference, to win the ACC. And 62 other people uh, voted for Duke. And then, so after all the votes were tallied, they sat me down and they were like, okay, we think you made a mistake. I was like, I think you guys made a mistake having to be in here asking this question. They're like, well, why would you pick UNC? Because Kyrie Irving was a freshman, Nolan Smith, the reigning ACC player of the year. I said, well, I listened to what everyone said, and I think the Duke's going to struggle a bit with chemistry. Plus, uh, UNC has Harrison Barnes, who's supposed to be you know, a highly touted player as well. They have the veteran leadership and Danny Green. And they go, yeah, you sure you don't want to change your vote? No, I'm like, oh, no, I'm good. UNC won the ACC that year. Now <laughs> the only Fulio that voted for them to do that. You can I check like it out. There's an article out there. I think it's from like the Charlotte Observer or something. There about you go. I, I love that. Well, I, I shared a story with Coach Jim Clemens, who was on my show just a couple of days ago. We were talking about uh, Hall of Fame Coach Tex Winter. And my bathroom story is we're going down to the bathroom at the same time and Coach Tex Winter's right there in front of me. We go up to the door and he, he, he looks me dead in my eye and he goes, coach, good prostate before Brad, bad prostate. And then we walked in and we just started laughing. <laughs> That's pretty funny. You know, those old coaches, man, all you guys, you always have the funniest little kid. <laughs> Oh, it's great stuff. Great stuff. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I want to thank Chris for your time. Uh, thanks for dropping the knowledge with us and, uh, and sharing your insights. And uh, I, I thank you for, for just sharing and connecting with all of us here today. And I hope that you stay blessed. I hope that you stay healthy. And hopefully we're going to see you uh, carrying that mic real soon. But before we go, do you have any other projects that are going to be coming on NBA TV real soon where you've kind of chopped it up with some players, something that we should be looking for? 
Well, uh, some of the recent stuff we've done has been pretty good. I uh, sat down and watched Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's uh, last finals MVP against mm-hmm. the Boston Celtics at the age of 38. And, you know, yeah. when we have that greatest of all time conversation. How about a guy that won six championships in the 70s, won uh, six MVPs in the 70s, won three championships after he turned 38, including a finals MVP? Make sure we keep him in that conversation as well. So I like we, it. That, we, we talk about that. And then Kevin McHale and Bill Simmons uh, sat down. We watched the Celtics Bucks Eastern uh, Conference Semis Game Seven from 1987. You remember those Bucks teams? Joel, uh, Terry Cummings, all So it was like the last run for the Celtics. And talking to Kevin McHale about his foot issues, uh, that was tremendous as well. Oh, great stuff. We'll definitely be uh, tuning in for that. You do a great job. And and again, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a lot of fun. Hopefully when this all comes down, good Lord willing, it will soon. We'll be able to cross paths out there uh, in the industry. All right, Scott. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it, man. Have a good day. You too. All right, my man, you stay safe out there now. All right, you too. Good. Thanks for having me. You got it, brother. You got it.